So, hello and welcome everybody. Um, this is the Brown Marmorated Stink Bug Information and Question Session. My name's Rachel Mogorley. I'm an AHDB crop protection scientist. I am a research manager predominantly for the fruit sector and I'm the tree fruit panel manager. If you need to get in contact with me, my email is here at the bottom and I'll show it again at the end of the session. So just to go through a few housekeeping things before we start. All attendees are going to be muted throughout this session just to make it easier for us to manage. So um, because we really want questions from you all, please use your control panel um, to type in the questions and then I'll read these out um, to Glenn or I'll answer them myself um, at the end of the session. Um, so, uh, and then we have got basis in the ROSO forms. Um, it's getting increasingly difficult to get points for these at the moment. So we've, got, we've just got one point for each of those. Um, if you want to claim these, then the, they can be found in the handout section of the um, control panel. The recording will be made available on the AHDB Horticulture Events Archive web page after the event. It takes us about a week to upload these, so don't panic if you can't find it immediately afterwards. This is just because we edit um, as we go along. Um, and all delegates should be automatically emailed a copy of this as well. So just to give you a quick history of Brown Marmorated Stink Bug um, and our association with it here at AHDB, we, continue, uh, we started monitoring for brown marmorated stink bug um, as part of the tree fruit TF223 um, IPM project. And we, um, although we didn't trap any um, as part of pheromone monitoring, we did find um, them in 2018 and 2019 in Hampshire. And Glenn's going to talk to you more about this um, during the presentation. This monitoring was um, funded this season by DEFRA and the pheromone traps did trap some of the brown marmorated stink bugs. We also, with BBSLC, had a project um, to develop a rapid identification method for brown marmorated stink bug. Again, this was done by Glenn Powell, and he's going to talk to you more about this during his presentation. We've expanded the remit of the SWD working group to cover brown marmorated stink bug. And the next meeting of this um, group will be in January. So if you've got anything that you'd like to raise at this meeting, please get in touch with me and I'll make sure it's on the agenda. Um, and we're going to be launching a trial um, as part of our SEPTA Plus work on efficacy for shield bugs. It's difficult for us to <laughs> do any efficacy testing directly on brown marmorated stink bug. So this trial will be um, targeted at forest bug um, with the hope that anything that we find will be um, relevant to brown marmorated stink bug as well. So just to run you through the um, program for today, it's quite simple. Um, the session's already started. Um, we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Glenn Powell, who's the research leader, who's a research leader in entomology at the IRBMR and leading the work on brown marmorated stink bug. Then we're going to have an opportunity for questions following this, and then we hope to close at about 4 p.m. So it's uh, with great pleasure that I now hand you over to Dr. Glenn Powell. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Um, can I just check that you can see my uh, first slide? Yeah, just make it the full screen. screen. That's it. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, um, yeah. What I'll do is uh, take you through some of the um, uh, background, but also uh, the recent findings on brown migrated stink bug. And in fact, uh, the structure of, of the presentation is given here. So uh, I'll give some introduction um, to the pest and then look at um, how we can identify it and, and recognize it um, from other shield bugs that, are, that occur in the UK. Um, and then I'll give an update on the current situation um, in the UK um, and look at the uh, potential for establishment of populations. Um, I'll also look at what we can be doing to prepare for this potential in terms of monitoring and control, um, and then take questions at the end. So just to, to start with then, um, in terms of introduction, and the, um, the pest is a true bug in the order Hemiptera, um, which means that it's got um, long stylet mouth parts uh, and it's a liquid feeder. 
So for the hemiptera that feed on plants, they, they push these into plants and, and feed on plant sap. So this is um, quite similar to other pests that we're familiar with, like capsids and aphids and whitefly and so on. But these are in the um, shield bug family um, or, or pentatomids. Um, we call them shield bugs in the UK uh, because of their body shape, but um, they also uh, emit a, a smell um, as a kind of defensive reaction. Um, and so they tend to be called stink bugs elsewhere in the world. And this particular species is originally from Asia. And the life cycle um, involves various life stages. Um, the females deposit egg masses underneath the leaves. And um, these egg masses hatch in, in a few days into a little cluster of nymphs. And these first stage nymphs tend to stay next to the egg masses. Um, and then from the second instar onwards, they tend to then wander and disperse um, and, and can walk to find new plants. Um, there are five nymphal stages in total um, and their final molt to adult. Um, from that point on, of course, they have wings and they, they can disperse by flying and not just walking. There's typically um, at least one generation per year, depending on the climate. Um, in very suitable countries, uh, they can achieve two, three or, or more generations per year. Um, but one thing about these uh, stink bugs, um, this brown marmorated stink bug, is its host range. Um, it can feed on over 100 host plants, and this includes ornamental trees, but also tree fruit, um, soft fruit, grapes, vegetables, legumes, lots of different um, horticultural crops can be affected. Um, and it's this kind of broad host range that contributes to its pest status. And the damage that they do occurs as a result of the feeding process. So like other sap feeding hemiptera, they push their stylets into plants, they cause direct damage, um, physical damage, they also inject saliva, and the reaction of the plant to all this can, can result in a brown lesion. Um, these Stink bugs particularly favour actively growing plant parts and developing fruit. Um, so you can get this kind of damage shown here to apple, um, but also to tomato and sweet corn and other crops that aren't shown here. So that's obviously um, a, a, a major problem and, and they're notorious pests as a result. But this particular species also causes other problems. And these are urban nuisance problems. And this occurs as a result of the natural overwintering behavior of the pest. Um, it's a kind of hibernation, although for insects, it's really called diapause. Um, and this means that the adults, and it's usually the adult stages of shield bug species that overwinter, they seek out sheltering sites for overwintering. In a natural environment, this would be things like cracks between stones or under loose tree bark. Um, but they're very happy um, to also crawl into houses. And brown marmorated stink bug has a natural aggregation pheromone. Um, and this causes um, or can cause thousands of bugs to aggregate in areas where they're well established. Um, and homeowners can end up dealing with um, these kind of numbers of, of the bug. Um, in addition to this kind of urban nuisance problem, this same behavior also brings the bugs inside um, packaging material, pallets, um, and so on. And also um, inside uh, new car engines, for example, they can wriggle down inside. And so various exports can carry the bugs with them around the world. And in fact, this is how the bug has really expanded its range globally. Um, it, it does this as a hitchhiker. Um, passively being exported around the world um, in shipping containers and, uh, and other uh, forms of exports. They also can get inside clothing and house contents and tend to travel with passenger luggage. So although these bugs can actually fly, uh, the adults can actually fly several kilometres or more, so they can disperse actively like this. Um, and once they arrive in a new area, then this kind of flight behaviour can you know, disperse them more locally. 
but their global expansion has been very much driven by this hitchhiking behavior. And um, this map shows that, that, that global distribution and gives a kind of a timeline as well. You can see that the um, native range in Asia is over here in China and, and Japan and Korea. Um, they, the, the bugs appeared in the United States um, from the mid 90s and then in Europe, initially from in Switzerland from about 2007. And subsequently, the bugs arrived elsewhere in Europe, also in Canada, um, and in Southern Hemisphere, so far just in Chile. There was also um, significant problems in Georgia over the last five years since its arrival there, and it's really caused uh, big problems with the hazelnut crop there. So this is on a country by country basis, but we can also look at actual records. And Tanya Yonov in Australia has been um, collating records of the bug. Um, and this gives a better idea of its real distribution, because obviously in some countries um, it's very well established. In others, for example, Chile, it's, it's just a, um, a couple of places where it's been recorded. Well, you can see that in the eastern United States, there are um, very many records and it's caused a lot of crop damage um, uh, to a variety of crops in, in this region. Also the west coast of the US um, and also through Europe um, and Georgia here. If we look more in more detail at Europe, you can see that the north of Switzerland, um, but also northern Italy in particular, has been uh, very um, heavily affected. And the brown marmorated stink bug has caused a lot of problems with orchard fruit in particular, um, nectarines, um, apricots and, and pears, for example, um, have been hit very hard there. But on this map, oops, on this map, you can see that the UK um, looks very nicely sort of cleaner of, of green dots. This doesn't mean that the bug hasn't been recorded in the UK because these records are for establishment. So for evidence of breeding and establishing a population, which we don't yet have in the UK. I'll say more about that later. But um, before that, just want to move on uh, and give some details about identification. Um, and as part of our surveillance efforts over the last three years at NIA BMR, we've been um, sending out press releases and, and publicizing um, the, the, this potential pest um, and asking people to be vigilant, um, pointing out the, the, the unique features of this of this shield bug um, and asking people to get in touch, uh, send us photos by email to this bmsb at emr.ac.uk address or to send in specimens. And there have been a number of inquiries um, and it's always obviously very valuable to check those out to be sure that, that, we're, that someone hasn't found bromarmorated stink bug. Um, but so far it's always been other species that have been confused with brown marmorated stink bug. Um, particularly, you can see forest bug is the most common one, um, but also hairy shield bug. Um, and then there are these other species, mottled shield bug, which is another invasive species and fairly recent arrival to the UK. Green shield bug, which is green for most of the year, but turns brown in autumn um, before they overwinter. Uh, and at that time of the year, they tend to, to be confused with brown marmorated stink bug. And then these two species um, on the right hand side, um, they're actually leather bugs or corids. They're in a different family um, and not particularly shield shaped, but um, nevertheless, they are large brown sap feeding bugs and they, they, they're also being confused with brown marmorated stink bug. So I just want to uh, highlight, uh, particularly for forest bug and hairy shield bug, uh, and the more commonly confused species, some of the differences with brown marmorated stink bug. And my thanks go to Marco Caradi at Berry Gardens, who's produced some nice slides uh, that show this uh, and, and shared those with me um, to use um, some of his images and labels. And so we start with forest bug, the most commonly confused um, species. A forest bug is um, Pentatoma rufopes, um, and it's a very common and widespread 
large brown shield bug that occurs pretty much throughout the UK. Um, and so it's not perhaps not surprising that it's being confused with brown marmorated stink bug. But if you look closely at it, then there, there's several uh, distinct differences. Forest bug doesn't have the banded antennae with the pale patches um, that brown marmorated stink bug has, and it doesn't have the white, white spots or pale spots across the thorax that brown marmorated stink bug has. What it does have is quite sharp points on the shoulders or the sides of the thorax. Um, and its other common name is red-legged shield bug because its legs are really quite orange, reddish colour. Whereas brown marmorated stink bug has kind of speckled um, brown and pale patched uh, legs. So um, forest bug um, is um, quite different when you look closely. Forest bug is, um, feeds on lots of different tree species, but has also particularly recently, in recent years, been noticed as a pest of um, uh, top fruit, particularly pears, but also apples. So it is also a, a pest that we are concerned about, but doesn't have the kind of global reputation of brown marmorated stink bug. Next uh, sort of common mistake is to um, confuse brown marmorated stink bug with hairy shield bug. This is Dolichoris baccarum, and um, it has um, not only a different shaped head to brown marmorated stink bug, which I, I should have said before that one of the kind of um, features that's most useful is that brown marmorated stink bug has a distinctly rectangular shaped head, whereas any other shield bug species that you're, you would encounter in the UK have more of a kind of a sloped triangular shaped head. Um, hairy shield bug does have black and white stripes on its antennae. Um, however, it doesn't have the spots across the thorax, but most um, sort of usefully, it, it, um, its body is covered in these fine hairs. You can see those on the edge of the body there, on the head and on the legs. And if you use a hand lens, you can see these very clearly. Um, whereas those wouldn't be present on brown marmorated stink bug. And then I just wanted to also include here the mottled shield bug, because although this is a recent arrival to the UK and is only really present in the southeast of England, um, it is spreading. And as it spreads, um, and as um, potentially brown marmorated stink bug also might arrive and spread, there's likely to be increased confusion between these two species. So mottled shield bug at first glance looks quite similar in that it is a kind of a, a speckled brown, um, rather large shield bug about the same size as brown marmorated. It also has dark and pale stripes on its antennae, but it has a different shaped head, not rectangular, more triangular. Um, it lacks the spots across the body um, and it has um, dark spots on the membranous part of the wings that are visible at the tip of the abdomen, even when the wings are folded. Whereas brown marmorated stink bug has more kind of rippled stripes on the wing. But the, the easiest way to um, tell whether it's a mottled shield bug or brown marmorated stink bug is actually just to flip the insect over because very conveniently mottled shield bug has this rather large sharp spike underneath. And this kind of starts at the base between the hind legs and points forward. Um, whereas brown marmorated stick bug and other shield bug species um, uh, that we're likely to find in the UK don't have that. So those um, images so far have all been for adults. Um, what about the nymphs, the, the juvenile life stages? Well, brown marmorated stick bug nymphs have spines. From the second stage onwards, they have spines on the edge of their body and also on the sides of their head. Um, and this isn't found for other um, shield bug species in the UK. Here's a photo of a forest bug nymph of about equivalent stage to this brown marmorated stink bug nymph. And you can see the smooth sides of the body and the head. Um, and that would be the case for other shield bug species in the UK. So um, really want to get the message out for people to look out for shield bug nymphs with spines on the sides of their body. Identification can be um, 
much more difficult if we're dealing with egg masses, um, which aren't very different for the different shield bug species, or maybe just fragments of, of shield bugs that might remain on a trap, maybe just a leg, um, and we want to find out which species it is. But um, as Rachel mentioned, we have uh, completed a short project where we uh, sought to improve PCR primers for detection of brown marmorated stink bug DNA. And we did um, develop very sensitive primers. This was uh, a collaboration with Queen Mary College, Queen Mary University of London, uh, Elizabeth Clare in particular. Uh, we developed very sensitive primers that work with um, diluted or even degraded or contaminated samples. So this helps provide the foundation for future work to develop high throughput um, screening for brown marmorated stink bug. Okay, so that's that was identification. Let's look at the, the current UK situation. And again, this is the map of Europe as compiled by Tanya Yonov, um, showing the distribution and showing the absence of green dots in the UK. But um, the bug has been found um, in the UK on several occasions. Um, and it's always been adults that have been found. This is partly through interceptions at ports of um, entry, at airports and, and shipping ports. And over a number of years, going back 10 years actually, um, there have been a number of these interceptions, either in imported goods or in passenger luggage. Now this isn't supposed to be uh, a complete list, it's just a list of interceptions that I've become aware of um, through um, uh, the publication by Melumphy or um, by um, other email contact or um, discussing um, these uh, interceptions with, with colleagues. But obviously this is something that, that is happening. Um, we're, ge we're getting a kind of a, probably a, a fairly regular influx of, of these uh, adults with um, with imported goods in particular. But more worryingly is that um, adults have actually been found in the interior of the UK free in the environment, not just intercepted with imported goods. And um, this has happened on three occasions to my knowledge. Um, initially in Hampshire in November 2018, in, in a town in Hampshire, um, a, a pest control expert was checking an external rodent bait box and found um, a brown marmorated stink bug overwintering inside. Um, the following year, uh, actually just a few miles up the road in Hampshire, um, a, um, a, a customer of a garden centre was unpacking their, their shopping into the boot of the car in the car park and noticed a brown marmorated stink bug um, that, that was uh, among the, the, the bought shopping and took a photo of it and, and posted it on iNaturalist for identification. And then this year in August, uh, a gardener in, in a Leicester city centre uh, garden was um, doing some hedge trimming and noticed uh, a brown marmorated stink bug adult and again photographed it, not really realising at the time what it was um, and it was later identified as brown marmorated stink bug. Um, so actually it's just the, uh, the first insect in, in Hampshire was actually collected for identification, but these photos are good enough to be able to identify and confirm the species. Um, so as well as kind of doing internet searches and looking at Facebook groups of enthusiasts of, of shield bugs and so on, um, looking at iNaturalist regularly, um, We've also been um, more actively surveying for brown marmorated stink bug through pheromone trapping as well. Um, this is possible because um, the pheromone lures are available commercially um, and um, they, they can be bought in kits with uh, traps. And so the lures that are shown here as these kind of black rectangles can be hung out in this case with double-sided sticky panels um, either in crop environments or, or, or in urban environments, um, usually um, just finding a, a convenient um, horizontal tree branch about two meters or so off the ground uh, and hanging them out. Um, and actually these lures are, are high dose, so they are good 
um, for a 12 week period. And then what we do is then replace them for a second 12 week period, starting the, tr the monitoring in, a, in early June of each year and running through till the end of November. And we've put these traps out at various sites. As Rachel mentioned, we started this in 2018, um, and this was funded initially by AHDB, where we had 10 different sites with one trap at each, and we repeated this in 2019. This year with DEFRA funding, we, we um, actually had 19 different sites and 22 traps in total. You can see their distribution here. Um, and I should point out that um, two of the traps, trap sites um, initially are within the M25. Um, this is the Rain and Marshes site here. This is the Natural History Museum site. And we also had a second site um, in Fulham, not far up from the Natural History Museum um, for the later period of trapping as well. So actually three sites within the M25 whereas most of them are outside, but, but a particular focus in the southeast. Well, it was at this Rain and Marshes site here that the first uh, brown marmorated stink bug was caught. And this is Yvonne Couch, um, who's the RSPB volunteer um, who hosts the pheromone trap at the nature reserve at Rain and Marshes. Um, and she's checking the pheromone trap there. Um, and in fact, on the 14th of August, Yvonne noticed a, a shield bug stuck to the trap. Um, and because Yvonne is a, 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 an expert on shield bugs and she does a lot of monitoring and knows the kind of um, the community of shield bugs uh, in Essex very well, um, she very quickly realized that this was a brown marmorated stink bug, which, which was confirmed um, by uh, myself and, and other uh, scientists. This is the specimen that she caught. Um, it was stuck to the trap by its wings and, and part of its wings and part of the thorax got removed um, as she took the bug off. But you can see enough features to be absolutely positive. It's brown myriated stink bug and actually with the wings removed, you can see the claspers here that show it's a male. A few days later, um, also in August, Max Barkley at the Natural History Museum um, was checking the trap in the Museum Wildlife Garden in South Kensington and um, recovered a second brown marmorated stink bug um, in London um, and um, this was another male. Um, this is just incidental really. The, the, the aggregation pheromone is um, actually attractive to both sexes. It's released by males but both males and females are attracted and actually even nymphs are attracted too, not just adults. So they will walk towards the pheromone. So it's possible that these traps could catch other life stages and, and both sexes. But the, the, the occurrence of, of, these, um, of these insects in these pheromone traps is, is really quite significant because for the first time we've now we've we've not only found the, the insect within the UK, but it's responding to natural signals, behaving naturally and flying within the environment. Um, uh, in order to actually be caught on these traps. And it's um, kind of um, tempting to kind of wonder what the origin of these, um, what these individuals was, because either they were imported as adults having developed from eggs that were laid in other countries, which seems possible, or perhaps they reflect a UK population um, and might have developed from egg to adult within the UK. We, we can have a look at these possibilities. Firstly, the possibility of being imported from overseas. And that is actually possible, although it won't have happened very shortly before we found the insects in August, because they don't get, get um, sort of, they don't show the hitchhiking behavior in the summer. It's, it's a, a winter associated behavior. And there's evidence for this um, because we know from colleagues in Australia that have very strict biosecurity measures and, and keep records of the intercepted brown marmorated stink bugs, that the hitchhiking season starts in about October, but particularly from November through to about February is where most interceptions happen. 
So if these adults were imported, they might have been imported several months before. Um, and we do know that these bugs are very long lived. The graph on the right shows results of experiments in Switzerland where the researchers actually collected the bugs from overwintering populations towards the end of the overwintering period in April and then kept them in cages under outside conditions with shelter and provided with food. They actually then followed the males and female adults through to see how long it took them to start to mate, reproduce, lay eggs, how long it took the limps to, to grow and so on. But they also just looked at those individual adults who were collected to look at their survival. And you can see that survival is pretty good. Even in mid-August, you've got about 30% survival of those original adults. And some individuals survive longer through October, November. So it is possible that the, that the adults that we caught might have been imported. The other possibility is that maybe they actually developed locally to where they were caught, somewhere in the UK and possibly not far away from where they were caught. And in order to look at this possibility, um, we've looked at the temperature data at the, each of the five locations where adults have been found, either in pheromone traps or just through um, chance observations. And the data that we've looked at is day degree data because we know that in order to complete a, a whole generation, brown marmorated stink bug needs 595 degree days above a threshold temperature of 12 degrees. So they can only develop above 12 degrees um, and they can only complete one generation if they have at least 595 days above that threshold. And you can see the data here for these sites um, and the green boxes show where the number of degree days above that threshold exceed 595. And this suggests that um, they could complete a whole generation and establishment would be possible. So that might hint that, that, that actually these, these bugs might have come from a population and potentially develop locally, but that is rather speculative. Um, also, um, there are better ways of modeling their um, their sort of establishment than just relying on um, the, this kind of thermal data. A more sophisticated sort of modeling is called Climax modeling. And this is widely applied to model the potential distribution of invasive pests. Um, it's called a, a bioclimatic niche model. Um, so what it does is look not only at, at the thermal requirements for development, but also other parameters such as day length, um, winter temperature, diapausing, um, inducing um, factors like that. Um, and it, it's more of a sophisticated way of predicting where a pest could establish. This was carried out uh, to look at the potential global distribution of brown marmorated stink bug. And this was published in 2017 by Criticos et al. Well, you can see that in terms of the UK, um, things look really good in terms of the outputs of this model. Most of the UK was highlighted as unsuitable for um, populations of the pest, except for a small region coinciding with Greater London and a little patch on the North Norfolk coast. Um, but there are pretty big caveats here, which were recognised by the, the researchers who published uh, this, this, uh, this paper. Uh, and one of those is that this uses average climate data over a fairly long period, and it doesn't account for the year to year fluctuation where you get an exceptionally warm year or maybe two or three exceptionally warm years that can allow population build up uh, and potentially um, establishment and maybe even um, outbreaks of crop damage. Um, but the other caveat is that this is historical data. Uh, it's from a 30 year period from the 19, early 60s through to 1990, centered on 1975. Um, and so it uses this average climate data, um, which is you know, increasingly dated. Um, and um, really we should be looking at current or projected future climate, uh, bearing in mind that we're likely to see 
global warming and, and that the impact of that on establishment of the pest. Well, um, Andy Evans in, in uh, SRUC in Scotland has been doing some uh, modeling and he's also used the Climex model. He also used the same data set, this historic data set centered on 1975. Um, so the output of that is very much as already published, although um, this analysis sort of shows it in more detail for the whole of the UK. But Andy's also looked at projected climate for 2050 um, using um, a kind of a, a medium emission scenario. Um, so this is not a worst case scenario, but a kind of a moderate scenario for 2050. Um, and using that data, um, it, it actually projects a, a much wider potential distribution of brown migrated stink bug in the UK. There's a large part of Southeast England and Eastern England that becomes suitable for establishment. In other words, more than one generation per year could occur. In actual fact, we're somewhere in between these two scenarios at the moment, because in 2020, we're sort of more than halfway between 1975 and, and 2050. Uh, and, and it's likely that this area here, Greater London or, or inside the M25, is probably suitable for establishment and this could be spreading outside of that um, over the next uh, uh, couple of decades. Um, but we really need more modeling to look at that more closely. However, um, that area uh, of Greater London is um, uh, of particular interest uh, for future monitoring for the pest. And the reason for that is that uh, we know from other invasive similar shield bug species that um, they, they do tend to pop up and establish in, in London initially before spreading outside. And examples of that include the southern green stink bug, Nazara viridula, which is um, as adults always like a light green colour, so not likely to be confused with brown marmorated stink bug. It's an invasive species that arrived about 20 years ago in the UK. Um, reports initially in London, but then more recently spreading outside into Kent, Essex and, and Hampshire and elsewhere. The mottled shield bug that I mentioned already looks quite similar to brown marmorated stink bug. Um, that's a more recent arrival. It's been in the UK for about 10 years. Um, initially, again, reported in London and then um, in more recent years, uh, particularly in Kent and Essex. And also um, there have been reports in West Sussex too. So, um, you know, this is the typical pattern and it's um, there's a, a kind of a, a known kind of effect um, that, that comes into play called the urban heat island effect, um, which tends to encourage the establishment of these invasive pests initially in large cities. And that's the case for brown marmorated stink bug as well, um, because we know that um, uh, in other cities, for example, in Paris and in, in Swiss cities, um, the uh, brown marmorated stink bug has initially become established in city centres, particularly in parks and gardens. It's usually noticed as an urban nuisance issue to start with, and then there can then be population build up and potentially outbreaks and, and, and pest damage to crops. Um, I've been interested recently just to look at the situation in Berlin, particularly because Berlin's on a similar latitude to Birmingham. Um, so, you know, the conditions there are quite similar to um, large cities in, 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 in the Midlands or, or in, in southern England. And in Berlin, there have been, um, well, since, it, since a couple of days ago when I looked, um, 138 observations on the iNaturalist app. And these are confirmed observations where people have submitted their um, photos and, and then they've been looked at and confirmed to be Burmah, I'm stink bug. So these 138 observations have only appeared over the last two or three years, and they include all life stages. So lots of different nymphs as well as adults and, and egg masses. So um, the, the species is certainly establishing in Berlin and um, is very likely to be able to establish um, in uh, southern England too. OK, um, just moving on now to um, what we can do, therefore, to prepare for this potential establishment. And I think the main thing we, we can do is continue monitoring and actually 
the more traps and the more effort we can put into this, the more likely we are to be able to um, pick up uh, potential established populations um, early and be able to uh, be advised about that and to be able to um, monitor and take action um, appropriately. Um, for monitoring purposes, these clear um, transparent double-sided sticky traps that we use in our monitoring are very effective, particularly as a sort of sentinel approach to detect the presence of the pest in the area. Um, hopefully we'll never see these kind of numbers that are seen overseas um, on a single trap using this type of approach, but they are good for first detection. Other uh, designs of traps are also available though, and on an individual trap basis, um, traps such as these black pyramid traps can be more effective and catch greater numbers. They are more expensive though. So these sorts of traps can be placed within crops or perhaps more usefully at the margins of crops where brown marmorated stink bug um, tend to um, uh, initially colonize crops and it is a very much a border pest. So it tends to um, occur in higher numbers around the borders of crops. Um, and if we do detect uh, the pest, then this can be followed up with sampling of foliage by the beating tray method. Um, and with, this is what we've been doing when we're, for, for our rain and marshes and for our uh, South Kensington um, catches, we've certainly been following up with beating tray sampling just to check that the pest is not present on, on plants in that area. Um, and I think very importantly for national monitoring purposes, it's very important that we try and get more traps out, but try and get more traps out in urban environments. And if we can get more traps out within the M25 at, at the moment, those are more, most likely to be uh, very useful in having uh, a chance of detecting the pest. Another thing we can do is actually get more value out of any, any future trap catches because we can combine monitoring with other approaches. And one of these um, would be to analyze the haplotype of um, any individuals that are caught. So if we save these um, individuals that we, we catch in pheromone traps, we can um, analyze their DNA and actually look at how they fit into these haplotype networks. So these kind of genetic types of brown marmorated stink bug um, that tend to be associated um, with particular regions of the world or some of them might actually occur uh, in several different countries and be more invasive than others. Also, some of these genetic types or haplotypes might be more tolerant to insecticides than others. So, you know, we can be more informed if we find out more about the bugs that do arrive in the UK. And something else we can do is to dissect uh, the adults and look at their reproductive status. This has been done before and published, um, particularly for females, it's possible to actually look at whether there are eggs developing within the ovarioles and what stage they're at. Um, and that gives an idea of whether the trapped individuals are pre-reproductive, whether they are actually ready to lay their eggs or whether they've already done that. Um, and that can be useful um, uh, and also can tell us um, more about the phenology of the pest uh, in the UK environment. What else should we be doing? Well, we, we can prepare um, to find out more about how this pest should be controlled and how it can be controlled more effectively because there's so much research going on elsewhere in the world where um, it's already become a major issue with crops. And we can look at what insecticides are most effective, but unfortunately they tend not to be very effective and the most effective products tend to be more broad spectrum products like pyrethroids and neonics, obviously not very compatible with an IPM approach. However, um, some IPM compatible approaches are being developed um, and because the pest is more of a border um, issue, it's possible to spray the borders of the crop, um, leaving the kind of center of an orchard, for example, um, unsprayed. Um, so it's, it's possible to continue to enhance natural enemies or, or to use mating disruption for control of Lepidopteran pests. 
Uh, this, this approach uh, in the States is being called the um, crop per perimeter restructuring approach for control. Also, we can combine insecticides um, with the pheromone um, as a so-called attract and kill strategy. So we can use the pheromone, the same aggregation pheromone that's, that, that's available for monitoring to attract the pest to individual trees in an orchard, for example, or to uh, an insecticide treated net. And, and in this way, the, the, the insecticide can, can just be applied to part of the crop or to the net, um, and it can uh, significantly reduce the uh, amount of insecticide that's being applied. So this is a, an approach that's in development, still experimental, but it does actually show uh, a lot of promise. Other management options are also available, and these include um, exclusion netting. In Italy, for example, um, it's been possible to uh, deploy netting over individual rows or, rows or even a whole area of, of uh, a tree crop uh, to protect from a bug. This has had some success, although it's obviously quite expensive uh, to install. And then biological control is also something to be explored. Um, unfortunately, generalist natural enemies don't seem to have a large impact on brown marmorated stink bug, but tiny wasps called egg parasitoids, these are um, little hymenoptera that lay their eggs inside the eggs of the stink bug, these show good potential for control. These include more generalist species like Anastatus, which can use shield bug eggs, but also moth eggs as well um, to, um, uh, as hosts. Um, obviously not ideal because if they're introduced into an area, they can affect non-target species and, uh, and, and also including conservation species. Um, Anastatus is, is um, present in parts of Europe. We don't know whether it's present in the UK. Um, I, ha well, I haven't found out any information about that. Um, but more, um, there's more potential in the more specific parasitoids that, that are originally from the same areas of Asia as brown marmorated stink bug. And these include Trasalcus japonicus, which is uh, shown here, um, and also Trasalcus mitsukuri. And although, the, although these are Asian in origin, they've started to turn up elsewhere. Um, and both of these species are, have been recorded in Europe. Um, so, you know, that's encouraging in terms of if we can, we can actually use them for biological control um, in order to help um, mitigate against brown marmorated stink bug. But again, we don't know whether these species are also present in the UK. Um, in fact, that's a, a major area uh, where more research is needed. OK, just so just to conclude, then, what we do know is that brown marmorated stink bug is present as adults within the UK um, and conditions are suitable for establishment, at least in parts of southern England, um, and it's likely to establish breeding populations within the next few years. There are other species that are already either natives like forest bug or hairy shield bug or um, recent invaders like mottled shield bug that are quite similar to brown marmorated stink bug in appearance. So it's likely that they'll continue to be confused with it over the coming years um, and um, after establishment. Um, we should continue to monitor with pheromone traps. I think that's the most useful thing we can be doing at the moment. Um, and particularly um, if we target more urban areas with these traps, then we're more likely to track uh, early establishment and spread of the bug. And although this is an insect to be concerned about, we can take some encouragement from the huge amount of work that's going on globally on this, on this pest. So researchers in affected countries are continuing to do some really good work developing and refining management strategies. Um, so, you know, us in the UK, as we continue to monitor the situation, um, we'll be able to continue to benefit and learn from those approaches. Um, the, there is a number of people and organisations I'd like to acknowledge. 
um, particularly the AHDB and DEFRA for funding the surveillance work, and the many helpers who have, have helped by setting up and monitoring pheromone traps. Um, that involves receiving a trap in the post, setting it up, checking it on a weekly basis, um, and uh, it's a really valuable um, uh, and, and um, uh, you know a, a, a really has contributed to us building up a picture of, of the um, bug in the UK. Andy Evans at SRUC uh, for um, doing the modelling of establishment and the potential distribution. And then researchers in Italy, Switzerland, Canada, um, also in Australia um, as well uh, for um, sharing information and, uh, and, and their advice. And also for Michelle at NIA BMR for uh, her guidance and advice throughout all of this work. Okay, so um, with that, I'll stop and I'll, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Glenn. That was fantastic. A really interesting and comprehensive overview. So thank you very much. Um, we've had quite a few questions in um, and I'm a little bit anxious about time. Um, so if we can't cover anything, then um, um, we can circulate further answers um, when we uh, send out the presentation. So just to kick off, um, presumably any brown ram rated stink bug finding themselves in polytunnels or glass houses are more likely to survive and breed. Should we be monitoring here? Um, I think that's a good point in that, you know, what I which I didn't mention, uh, when we're looking at these, the suitability for establishment, um, all the kind of modelling data and so on is, is outside conditions. Um, obviously, you know, under under polytunnels and, and in glass houses, um, the temperature is significantly higher, and it it could be. I mean, you know, certainly glass house crops such as peppers, some soft fruit crops um, have been attacked uh, elsewhere in the world. So um, it's it's something to bear in mind. I, I think the most at risk crops uh, are probably top top fruit in the UK. So that would be you know, the, the, the most, probably the most valuable monitoring in terms of a uh, crop by crop basis. Um, but yeah, we, we should bear in mind that um, it could potentially um, do damage under, under protection as well. Thank you. <laughs> and the, uh, well, the next question, I think you've slightly covered in your previous answer, but and um, there's a couple of questions on host preference. So there's many hosts, but is it known they have a strong preference for anything? Uh, is there any experience from northern Italy yet? Do they move far from host to host? And then there's a later question about um, potential for gut analysis to see what they're feeding on. Yeah, that would be a good approach. I mean, they do they do, do better on some. They, they do have a preference for some plants rather than others, for example, pear. Can be very preferred. Um, apple, on the other hand, I don't think they can, it's been shown that they can complete the whole of their life cycle on apple, um, but they can certainly do damage. The, the problem is that they, they actually have a preference for moving on, so um, they do move around quite a bit, particularly the adults can, can fly effectively and for, for numbers of kilometres, um, and they do seem to have a preference for, for having a mixed diet, so they will. They 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 use the aggregation pheromone during the summer as well as the winter, um, but but more for feeding and for aggregating on host plants. And they will kind of aggregate on um, in, in countries where they where they occur in high numbers. They'll aggregate on certain plants and then move on to other plants. So um, it, it's a very unfortunate situation because it doesn't take much feeding to cause damage, and by, by continuing to move on. They, they, they just do more damage. Um, I think uh, it's a good, a good suggestion that, um, that we might be able to look at, use DNA analysis to, to, to identify the, the host that they have been feeding on. That would be very interesting. I know it's been done for other sap feeding insects as well as many other you know, types of, of arthropods like spiders and other predators to find out what they're feeding on. It may well have been done for the brown myrated stink bug, but I haven't spotted any any studies on that. But that's something I'll go and check out. Thanks. That's good. Um, and then um, there's questions about overwintering. Um, 
So how important are overwintering sites such as buildings um, going to be? And could you envisage um, stacks of apple bins being good sites for them to aggregate and overwinter? Yeah, possibly potentially packing houses and, and barns and other other unheated uh, buildings would be very, very suitable um, because they want a place that's protected from the cold, but, you know, is that is going to be pretty cold uh, nevertheless. Um, so I think uh, that's actually another monitoring strategy is to actually check out um, these kind of uh, garages and, 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 and pack houses and so on and actually look around for these bugs because once they get established in an area they're likely to be detected um, overwintering in, in these sorts of habitats. Thank you and then um, another question related about monitoring um, so would it be possible to look for the um, egg parasitoids at the same time when you're monitoring for the brown marmited stink bugs? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think um, it, it would be very valuable to do that. Um, but what we, the best way of doing that would be to go out and, and actually collect um, egg masses of shield bugs from foliage and then bring them in um, and, and look, look for what emerges from, from those egg masses. That's an approach that's been used elsewhere in, in, in uh, for example, in, in Italy or, or in the United States and, and Switzerland to see um, what parasitoids are, are prevalent and what, what might be actually developing within stink bug eggs. So it's a kind of a different, a different approach to the pheromone trapping or the, or the kind of beating foliage for, for shield bugs. So it would need to be done in a different way. Um, also, it would be possible to use DNA detection techniques to actually um, look for different parasitoid species. That's been done elsewhere. So you know, that, that could be supplemented, looking at emergence of parasitoids from eggs could be supplemented by DNA-based detection. Um, so it's a, it requires a slightly different approach, but, but would be really valuable because as, as I say, we know very little about um, these sorts of parasitoids and, and it's relevant not only to brown marmorated stink bug, but the kinds of problems we're getting um, with forest bug already. Um, we, we don't know very much about what is controlling and limiting the the populations of forest bug and what we what we might be able to do to enhance its natural enemies so you know it's something that uh, would be very valuable thank you lots of ideas for further research there <laughs> so um, i'm very aware of the time because um we're already a minute over <laughs> so um, okay. i think we'll wrap it up there. but uh, thank you very much um everybody for joining in the call um and thank you very much to Glenn for giving up your Friday afternoon. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us all today. Um, thank so, you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, don't forget to submit your basis and Neuroso forms. If you've got further questions that occur to you over the weekend, then um, my email address is there. Feel free to get in touch with me. Um, and just a reminder that the recording will be available next week on the events archive webpage. Um, and it should be emailed out to all people that have registered as delegates. So thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed that, Glenn. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>